get ready to get Rumble. ready to romance your TBR or romance your TBR. That makes a little bit more sense for us. I then Rumble. We want to start with a bonkers book segment. Yes, you told you me that you. Have I one have in a bonkers wings. book. I do. I actually have many because I've been reading a lot, but I'll just do one. Um, because I am a seasonal reader. Ooh, mm-hmm. I'm very much a seasonal reader. Uh, th- that I will not. I don't do TBRs because I can't stick to them. But I do like yeah. to have like large lists, large long lists of books that are appropriate for a particular season or theme to choose from within a particular month. And I'm a big Halloween girly, which mm. means I have a giant list of paranormal, both contemporary but especially paranormal historical romances that I am excited about for the month of October. And so I just finished a book called A Wolf in Duke's Clothing. The premise of this book, it's a wolf shifter Regency, I believe, romance. And, like, there's a lot of lore going on, and the thing is, I don't care. Same. Um, like, I, I need it to make that. sense for the, like, the book. Like, I need to, yes. like, the plot to make sense, but I yeah. don't actually care about the lore, and there's a lot of lore. But basically, he's a duke, he's a wolf shifter, everyone on his estate, like, they're all different animal shifters, and they're all his pack. Um, Shit. Wow. And so he and his beta are back in he's been like traveling the world for the past five years looking for his basically his faded mate um there's like a a fancy latin word for it that like i think it translates to like true love but he's looking for his mate um and basically you come to find out that there's like this curse on his family because his parents lied to everyone and told everyone that they were like mates but in reality they weren't and then they were really awful to their kids and so then like the goddess cursed them so now no one in the pack that isn't already mated can mate and no one can have kids until the alpha mates with his like true love faded mate and he's been gone traveling the world for the past like five years looking for her and for some reason and this kind of lost me but again i wasn't paying attention to the lore for some reason he's figured out that she is she must be an aristocratic lady of the ton i don't know why that's i don't remember how he figured that out but he's back and he's looking for her and he's at this ball and he scents her and he's like oh that's her and he goes and finds her she's a wallflower um and he like drags her out and makes her dance with him a couple of times and then drags her off to the balcony which is very scandalous and then he like grabs her and jumps over the balcony wall and disappears into the night with her hang on tight and- spider monkey <laughs> <laughs> and he basically like sticks her in his carriage and she's mm-hmm. like what are we doing and it's like him and his beta and omega um and he, like, Loki kind of kidnaps her and takes her off to his estate. And she's yes. like, what are we doing? And he's like, well, you're ruined, so we have to get married now. And she's <laughs> like, I don't want to get married. Meanwhile, Felicity, the heroine, she's got this whole tra- – she's, like, a really low-ranking aristocratic lady. Mm-hmm. She's an orphan. Her horrible uncle and horrible cousins uh, are, like, meddling in her affairs. And supposedly, according to her very evil uncle, she's been told that her father left her a bunch of, like, money and whatnot. Um, but only if she doesn't get married. Until, oh. like, she has to turn 25 and be unmarried, I guess. Mm. Um, she's also – she's doing this, like, horse breeding thing. Mm. Her mom had this herd of mares. She's doing horse breeding. She wants to keep doing that. Um, but it turns out, of course, her uncle is lying to her. And she actually does need to get married. Or, like, she doesn't have – it doesn't matter. Whatever. The will is missing. Her dad's will is missing. She can't get in touch with the lawyers. Ooh, something is going on. Everything is mysterious. The Duke is like, um, but, which by the way, they haven't told her that they're all shifters. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, just does like, she? No. Because, you know, they're just some... like, well, you've been ruined. <laughs> um, so we have to get married. And also, he's trying to, like, court her, but also he's, like, part wolf, and his wolf really just wants to, like, mate with her. <laughs> there's a lot going on. I wolf you. There's, there's a lot happening. He, by the way, his name is Alfred. He's the alpha. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Oh, it's all like that, though. I just, the beta is named Bates. No. And the Omega is named Omara. No. Um, there is okay. a little maid who's very cute. Her name is, like, Mary Mossett or something. Okay, and it's well, very obvious nice. that she's a mouse shifter. Oh, um, that does kind of sound like a mouse. Yeah. There's a lot. There's, everybody is huh. an animal. She doesn't know, but she's, like, kind of unique and quirky and really loves animals. And so, so it works. Just... Oh, God. Look. It actually could have been way more bonkers. I wish it had gone a little bit crazier. There, there was, um, was it Go Hex Yourself, I think. And um, there was this, like, cat shifter or, like, this, like, wizard warlock thing turned into a cat, got stuck as a cat. 
And then he was just like the cat was like always spying on the heroine. <laughs> and the um Adam Driver esque hero, because it's basically the life hypothesis with magic. Um, and like if you look, his face is on the cover. Like it's him. Yeah. And he would like get very angry at this cat, and she was like, What? He's a cute little cat. Like he's just being like a cat. And he's like, get the fuck out because like he, she'd be showering and the cat's like hey oh my god <laughs> and like she'd be like sleeping in her bed and the guy's just like get out like stop and so i can just imagine like those situations if they're just a bunch of animals and she's like i love animals let's cuddle she does love animals well there's like she like runs into him in his wolf form not realizing that he's a wolf but she oh. is not like other girls understand she loves animals mm-hmm. and so she instead of like running the other direction from this i think she said he like comes up to her shoulder like this oh, is so a, a massive black so like so like wolf. twilight this is a giant animal um but she just like senses that he's not that he doesn't mean her harm oh yeah and so she just starts talking to him she calls him your grace because she thinks he's like the most majestic and then names him alfie and i'm like girl and why are you whatever so she like tells all of her problems to (laughs) this wolf not realizing that the wolf is this guy that she's like magnetically attracted to but also doesn't like because he's kidnapped her but she's not even that upset about it if i'm being honest look it's a weird book it's a bonkers book did i have a good time yes can i say it's like super well written i don't know about that (laughs) but it gave me what i wanted it was a Mm -hmm. wolf shifter historical romance my main note is that i wish it had gone more crazy i wish it had been more bonkers Mm -hmm. but getting to our actual uh, like podcast episode bonkers book Mm -hmm. of this episode it is an Stay. author feature an author feature yeah. with one of uh, my favorite authors i Same. assume one of your favorite as oh well. oh yes yes um india holton who is also oh. just like a delightful human being mm-hmm. anyway um <laughs> yes mm-hmm. the wisteria society of lady scoundrels and the league of gentlewomen witches and soon to be the C- and- the secret service of yes tea and, tea and treason that's such a cool title it's a cool title. They're all just, like, really long, so I always yeah. forget. It's, like, the Immortals After Dark books, and I'm always, like, I don't know. The, the, mm-hmm. the third one. Um, the one that the I'm third. very excited about that's coming out. I am actually obsessed with these books. So I've read mm-hmm. each of them twice. I did not do the audiobook on either, which is now very oh, rare for me because so I do good. Um, so much on audio. But I did. I Obviously, I, the... I bought the Kobo one as soon as this book launched because I was and am obsessed when I read the arc. Um, of the second one, so the League of Gentle Women Witches, and so like my Kobo was raring to go that next day because like if you don't know, Kobo is my key to su- success because it's cheaper than Audible. Every month you get charged ten bucks, I think, and then you just get like a credit. So I have like credit saved up for a rainy day. Um, that's where I use like my my well loved books, um, like Angelica Frankenstein. I bought there. Always Be My Duchess. Bought there because I have no time to wait in long library holds so yeah very good audiobooks amazing well i did not do audio for either of Mm -hmm. these um i did however i remember downloading the like net galley widget of the first one reading i think i got through half of it before i immediately ordered the physical copy online Mm -hmm. and was like i need this book immediately in my hands right now um but i think i finished it on my kindle and then the second one i did Obviously through Neck Alley. Yep. Um, as soon as they approved my request, which admittedly took longer than I wanted it to. I was oh, like, yeah. I was chomping at the bit waiting for them to approve my request. And then when they mm-hmm. did, I think I read it in like a day. Um, and then when Gentlewomen Witches was coming out in, when was that? March, I think. Lord my knows, I don't know. lovely friend, Megan, um, Meg Mazzaferro, and I did um, a reread of the mm. first book and for us a reread of the second book although we obviously waited until like it was mm-hmm. out and everyone could do a read along with us and then did like live tiktok streams mm-hmm. together to discuss each of the books and so that time i tabbed and i annotated so each smart of those books. i wish like i literally bought tabs and i had this book setting like sitting out for that purpose to just like go through my kindle and like see mm-hmm. what i had all highlighted there Mm-hmm. And it has never happened thus far. So, well, so I don't normally. I'm not a big tabber. If I'm yeah, doing an ebook, I will highlight. But in, mm-hmm. 
I if it's a book that I know I will love, I used to do more like annotations, not like tabs, but just like writing in yep. the book. I would annotate sometimes. Typically, I only tab and annotate if it's a reread yeah. of a book that I really love, and then I'm and like, like, okay, like I did that with all of my Emily Henry books when I reread yeah. them. I just I always go to the audiobooks for a reread, so mm-hmm. I and then I don't really have time to like listen and tab at the same time which I could I could make time I just say I'm going to and I never do um but yeah I was like looking through my ebook notes for the book too and I was like oh Alex oh no it's like it's like ones that I know I want to Mm -hmm. have notes on though and these ones Mm -hmm. these I think are books that I'm not a big rereader because I always get stressed out about all of the unread books that I have Mm -hmm. so for me to Mm -hmm. reread a book it has to be like Oh, I reread like all the really time. really good book. I just don't have the – like, I will get stressed because I'm like, I have all of these other books piling up that I need to get yeah. read. And so for me to reread one, it has to be one that, like, if I'm, I really love it and I'm going to commit time to it. Yeah. If I'm, like – I mean, since I'm a mood reader, like, if nothing is speaking to me, I will go back and, like, like that I have from Libby or something, I'll go back and just reread one. Or – you know, if I'm in a huge slump, like if I'm reading like a bunch of like three star books, I'll go back to one that I know um, will give me what I want. And yeah, I I reread criminally. It's actually I'm probably bad, but it's fine. Pushing forward. But that being said, even though I don't reread a ton, I think these are – you like have to reread this. You will miss a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because – there is so much going on Mm -hmm. and because the plot is so like the world build or the world is so different and you get dropped into it which is my favorite thing in fantasy books too i don't want a bunch of exposition no i don't want you to explain everything to me i want you to drop me into the world and it's going to be chaotic for a while and i'm not going to understand what's going on and then i will either sink or swim Mm -hmm. i will figure it out and i think that the opening scene of wisteria society well even from the like table of characters already you're getting (laughs) i like what is this book i adored the chapter headers the chapter headers are phenomenal one of my very first like more viral tiktoks was my like recommendation video for the wisteria society and Mm -hmm. it's my favorite chapter titles yeah they're so fun they're so fun um the table of significant characters is one of my favorite just like things i've ever seen it's so like Oscar Wilde like there's something about it where I was like yeah and they're funny the, this book is hilarious when I was listening I was listening earlier today and yesterday um to the second audiobook and just I mean it goes hand in hand with the narrator's performance because like I said she is amazing um but there's just like moments where they're like we're gonna like crash into this giant body of water and then just like her intonation when she says splash because like they obviously splashed and like fell in it's just they're so fun and i want that sense of humor like i want to embody that every day because it's chaotic but it's the best kind it is chaotic so you get like the table of significant characters which is already kind of unhinged um and quite hilarious like you get teddy luke's a fencing master with provocative hips (laughs) um or like student i can't even say that pseudonymous hotel guests Su- oh student pseudonymous i think that's how you say that but the point like they're all these like kind of chaotic like very funny charming descriptions and then you get chapter one with all of the different um like titles an unexpected caller the plight of the awk semantics and you're like what is this what is going on because already what are we doing and then you get dropped into what you think is, like, kind of a funny, like, historical, like, very quintessential Victorian stuffy yeah. scene. And then all of a sudden there is a pirate at the door <laughs> talking about the plight of Ox. And Cecilia's like, those are extinct. And then she goes back and she's like, there's a pirate at the door. Ned is immediately in love with her. It's just, like, so much <laughs> happens all at once. He, like, throws a bomb in through the window and you're like, what? And before you know it, houses are flying. And I was like, here we are. Magic is being done. And like, I understand when people are like, oh, I tried to read that book, but like, I I couldn't get into it. Like, I totally understand Mm -hmm. 
why this book doesn't work for everyone, especially initially. I mm-hmm. think it's something that, like, if you like getting dropped into that and you're like, this is chaos, where are we going with it? Yeah. It I, works. I found book two a lot easier, obviously, because I already knew what I was getting and, like, I knew the yes. world. But book two was so much easier to just, like, be in from the start um i mean mm-hmm. i loved this i mean the first one was like the princess bride to me it just has that like humor mm-hmm. of you don't really need to know what's happening because it's happening um but the second one really that's that's my favorite of the series just because i love the romance and it's a little bit more romancy i think um than I'm the so first scared. one um but the first one itself like it's just so fun and well, I think it's- yeah i wouldn't have like you get the reason why the houses are like flying but like Mm -hmm. like I said like I don't like world building I don't like fantasy very much because I don't have the time I don't like clothing descriptions like like I said like I can't picture what they're wearing like I don't know like stop telling me colors and fabrics and stuff like I don't know um and so I just really had a good time having no clue and then there's like Bronte (laughs) like the villain thinks he's like related to Emily Bronte (laughs) No, well, yes, but the to bra uh, Bran the uh, the Brom Branwell Branwell Bronte Branwell the brother. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah. So I think that these are books that you have to reread because at least with the Wisteria yeah. Society, I mean, I think that it's easier to get into the League of Gentlewomen, which is not because necessarily like the world building is any less mm-hmm. daunting, but just because we've already read. Yep. A whole book set in this universe so now we already know what's going on we're just catching up on what's happening with the witches rather than like getting dropped into something not understanding what's going on so i think if mm-hmm. i had started with the league of gentlewomen witches maybe my response to it would be different unclear but i do think because the first read of these books i spent the whole time trying to figure out what was going on and following the plot and then just like figuring out the initial romance the second time i read it I already understood the world, so I I wasn't confused in trying to figure that out. Um, I already understood where the romance was going, and so I caught approximately, and I don't, I don't want to be dramatic here, but I, I would say probably around 4,000 more little jokes and references than I did the first time, because every, like, practically every sentence is, like, a wordplay or some kind of joke. Mm Mm-hmm. Or, like, an allusion to some literary thing. That it's happened when I, when I listened to the audiobook. Because, um, like, obviously I read it and then waited until the audiobook came out. And there was just so much. And I definitely haven't even picked it all up. So, like, oh, I could, yeah. like, physically go back and reread this and have a completely different experience. Which I think is the best part of rereading. Sure. Like, whenever I reread something, I will always pick up more stuff. Yes. Like I said, I am very slow on the uptake. Like, I am not the you know brightest bulb of the bunch so um i am always excited and i also have a terrible memory so i will forget what happens <laughs> and be so surprised when i reread <laughs> i mean well, these I just are no you know yes i just know about myself like if i want to do any kind of critical analysis and this is a mm. book that i think lends itself to critical analysis particularly with all of the literary illusions um, if I want to do that at all, it's going to have to be on a reread because my yeah. critical thinking brain is not on on the first time I read a romance. Like I just I need to like absorb the plot and like the actual romance itself. And then when I go back, I can unpack it. But like mm-hmm. there are just so many like running bits that I caught on to that I didn't the first time I um, there's this running bit. I think it's one of my favorites where she refers to the wits like her wits as little characters where I, I just flipped to this one at random but where it's like cecilia's wits drag themselves up shoving arms into jackets slapping helmets on heads coming more or less to attention um and like the wits come back over and over again where her wits will do things um or just like little running bits like that yeah. that i didn't necessarily like i thought they were funny the first time but it wasn't until rereading that i started noticing all of them working together um <laughs> i'm i'm like looking through my review and i literally said um it's like the princess bride and withering heights from the writers of shrek 3 with a touch of up <laughs> like yeah what? like shrek 3 like there's just something about shrek that really feels <laughs> like especially like the second like through because like the first shrek is its own thing i think then they get really into like the fairy tale but like the villain was so much like prince charming but like prince charming is just so dramatic and like <laughs> absurd but also hilarious and you also kind of want to root for him like that's how I, I felt 
with just like the drama of this man thinking he's related to the Brontes and making it his entire personality, which like I would too. Um, so it like Shrek three really stood out to me um, there. And, you know, that's maybe like just a me thing, but I sure loved it. I think that it I had like in my initial video recommendation, mm-hmm. I had like the, a similar like this is like the Princess Bride meets this. Um, yeah. But I remember saying, like, if this was all a movie, like, The Princess Bride meets Monty Python, Mm -hmm. directed by Wes Anderson and then adapted into a book by Oscar Wilde, that is the energy Mm -hmm. of this book. It Mm -hmm. felt very Wes Anderson to me, like, very colorful. Um, The humor reminded me of it. I don't know. I'm not a Wes Anderson expert. It just really sure didn't know who he was. So okay, well, if you watch some Wes Anderson movies, you will know what I am talking. Oh no, I know like the Grand Budapest. Like, I can definitely feel it. I think the soundtrack also, like, the kind of quintessential Wes Anderson soundtrack. I I have a bunch of his songs or, like, songs from his movies on my playlist for these books because I can just listen to them in the background while I'm reading. And it makes sense Mm -hmm. in my brain. Like, there's a very specific style to these books. And there is literally no, like, other comparable books that I can think of that I'm like, oh, these have a similar vibe. The only one that I have found is completely different but also just like fucked me up in the same way was the undertaking of heart and mercy um like it's so unique and odd and weird that you know they're really not similar really at all but just the way it made me feel like when i was reading it yes. i was just like i have no well, clue what's also, happening but i don't want to yes. know like because you're just also thrown in that one and you got you get weird dropped ass into words. this weird fantasy world mm-hmm. and, and so like old. you know if you like that book or like the Wistier Society or like the League of Gentlemen Women Witches, maybe read that one. Um, because I can see why people for both books would be like, this is just not for me, which mm-hmm. totally valid. Um, they are wrong, but they are valid and entitled to I, their opinions, even if their opinions are wrong. No, I do understand like why you would be put off trying yeah. to start. And books. also like the sense of humor. Like, I feel like this yeah. really, you know, feels like my type of humor. And so like, I have a really good time. Um, but I know some people, like, they're just not what they like. So I, I completely get it. And, like, I wouldn't want you to, like, read it. Like, try to force yourself if you're not feeling it. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe try the second. Like, if you didn't, if you were, like, okay with the first one, not, like, your favorite thing, I would try the second one just to, like, it. like, if you have any curiosity. I mean, he's an Irish tattooed pirate who's just absolutely obsessed with her. Like, I, and she, oh, my God. Like, it's just so good. It's, so it's good. just so – they push two beds together because there are two beds, not one, and they're offended. <laughs> it's just – If I uh, had a nickel for every historical romance with a DIY one-bed trope, I'd have one two nickel. nickels. You'd have two nickels. What's the other one? I would have two one? nickels. The Duke Who Didn't. Oh, my God. You're right. The Duke Who Didn't – well, technically, the Duke Who Didn't isn't that there's two beds. It's that they get to the inn, and she has <laughs> yeah. decided in this moment to, like, take her yeah. life into her own hands. Yeah. And she's like, if we go in and there's only one room available, <laughs> that'll be the sign I need to, like, sleep with this guy that she's been in love with. And then they get there and the, the inn – what's like, his no, name? Like, so the guy many. is like, yeah, we have a lot of available rooms. <laughs> and she, like, slaps money down on the desk and is like, you only have one room available. And that man is yeah. so confused. But he's finally like, okay, <laughs> I guess. Which I, I count as DIY one bed. And oh, for sure. Charlotte and Alex also seeing the two beds, and they just mm-hmm. go, no. So they push them together, and they're like, here's one bed. Which also creates for a really lovely, like, chaotic uh huh, um, moment where she's like, and then the world fell out from under them, but it literally, <laughs> literally. didn't because the beds had come apart. Because <laughs> um, they were going at it. Ugh, I listened to that so scene good. twice this morning. Um, what I do, what I like to do is end an audiobook right after a sex scene. Like, if I have to go to bed or if I have to, like, go to work or, like, do something, I'll get to that point, end it, even if, like, I have a little bit of time left, because then when I, like, start the audiobook up again, I'll just hit that good old rewind button and listen to it over again. So I listened to it twice today, and I had a very good time both times. I just always, like, I tend to pause in those moments because Mm. usually they precede some kind of, like, breakup or something going wrong. Yeah. This may be because I read a bunch of Sarah McLean back to back and her mm-hmm. like if they sleep together, that's a sign. He's probably gonna leave. Something's gonna yeah. happen immediately and after. That, so that I always like me... get to that point because they're emotionally happy yeah. and then I can like pause and come back to the break this... because I'm not ready for it. And I don't want to pause in the middle of it. 
this first one for them happened around like 50%. So there, there was enough time. But I hate when that, like, I know, like, sometimes that happens. And, like, it makes me sad. Like, when you know they're, like, all cuddly and then you know something bad's going to happen. You see um, it coming. Yeah. And, but that definitely happens a lot. I just realized we never gave, like, I guess if you're listening to this, you've already read these books, but we never talked about, like, the premise. Oh, like, what these boy. books are. I don't even know how you, I, describing these books, I hate it uh-huh. because they're fantasy historical romances about lady pirates who fly houses um, and follow very strict Victorian uh-huh. social so the fir- rules. The first one was two pirates together. Sure. Um, And he was, he was technically, like, the enemy a little bit because he was working with the <laughs> enemy he was working with everyone else though but he was also like trying to seduce the enemy but he was like not it was just <laughs> he <laughs> was hired by her like i think she's her godmother she is yeah to assassinate um I'm i'm blanking i don't remember but she's amazing lady mm-hmm. armitage Armitage, um, yes, that's the one. Who is, like, very close with Cecilia's aunt who raised her. Mm-hmm. But by close by, it means they've been, like, trying to kill each other for decades. With love, yeah. Like, um, so they, she hires yeah. him as an assassin. Mm-hmm. Well, also, she really has many names. Sure. She's very into him because it's Ned. Um, yeah. And everyone's attracted to Ned in all of his mm-hmm. different disguises. Anyway, <laughs> he's hired to assassinate her, but he's also... In disguise, working for other people, and also working for the queen, but he's also working for himself. Mm -hmm. But he's also actually, (laughs) like, trying to save Cecilia because he loved her mother. Not in, like, a in-love-with way, but, like, her mother was really kind to him. Uh Uh-huh, and then he, like, yes. I don't know if I want to give it away. Like, if you've read it, like, if you, like, pause, skip, whatever. There's, like, he's got, like, a locket or something, and, like, so he, like, yeah. Knows what the mother looked like, and then Cecilia looks. Which everyone has, by the way. Everyone has a picture of Cecilia's mother. Mm. It's like a running thing. And Cecilia's yeah. like, why do all, like, everyone is obsessed with <laughs> Cecilia's mother. I wish I could find. Yeah, I um, I wanted to read this one more so than the second one, because I remember less of the first one. Um, but the audiobook was, like, holds galore at, like, every library that it was available at. Well, I should have just um, dug and, out my notes from well, the reader. Well, I have, I have the PRH audio, so, like, I can request it from them, which I'm going to do, but I didn't have time because, of course, I wait till the day before we record um, to do this. Um, but, yeah, I... But I... Um, Ned has this really lovely observation about, like, Cecilia being the key or something. Mm. Like, Cecilia is the center of everything. Even though everyone seems to be focusing on her mother, he's like Cecilia is the center of this. Like she unlocks Aww. it. Um, there's a lot to unpack with like there. Ned's relationship with her mother. We're really <sighs> everyone's relationship with her mother versus how Cecilia feels about herself and her relationship well, with then, her mother. Because then her father is the villain. Yes, the one who thinks that he is related to Bromwell Bronte, um, and so. And then he did, did he like kill her mother? Or like, there's a lot of like emotions there in the sense that he's the villain, but he's also just like over the top Prince Charming esque um, and absurd. And then there's also the Lady Armitage, which is she working with the father or are they like not in cahoots? I really don't know. Um, hopefully, you've read these because this will make no sense to you. <laughs> yeah, I, if you haven't read I'm these so books. sorry. I mean, if you haven't, like, this is a great time to read them. It's like witchy season. And they are great for laughs. They're also, yeah, they're just so, so funny. And you mm-hmm. will not get all of the jokes. No. Not even the second time through. Um, no. I also caught Star Wars references on the second yeah. time through that I was so, I was like, how did I miss that the first time? I found my notes from the last time I did a read along, which is why I'm like, ah. Now, these are super out of context, so I'm like, what notes was I talking about? I have one note that's just Patrick, Patricia, and Patricide, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, because her, the father's name is Patrick, right? Yeah, I make Patrick that Morvath. Captain Morvath is just what it's called. So technically, Ned is also working for the Captain Morvath, which is her father, so then that's why he knows about her mother, but then he's also with Lady Armitage, and she thinks that he's going to hook up with her. And so she's just, like, raring to go, dusting off the cobwebs. And he is rather scared of that. Um, 
I want to do a deep dive on like each and every one of these characters um, because like Ned in particular is so, so fascinating to me. The way that he has like all of his different names mm-hmm. that are all some version of Edward Light or Lightborn. Yeah. Like Ned Lightborn, Eduardo De Luca. He's got a lot going for him. Yeah. And then he's also he has a different name when he's like working for the queen. Mm-hmm. But it's also like Edward something about Light. Also, I don't know how you get Ned from Edward. Like, I get the Ed, but, like, where's the N come from? I'm it, gonna be uh, honest. There's a lot of nicknames that are like that. I, it disturbs me. I mean, like, Dick Richard. Like, I get it. Um, I'd be more disturbed by that one, like, if I was a Richard. Um, you get but it? Ned. But you don't get Ned? No, no, like, I get, like, that I'm not, like, I'm not gonna get it. Like, I oh, get that. Okay. I accept it. I was it. like, <laughs> I, I don't know where they came up with that one. Major Candent is his, um... Ooh. Major Candon. Yes. And Samara Parish is one. Edward is also called Ned by like his siblings. And I'm like, who are you talking about? I was like, oh yeah, it's Edward. I, I get like very Ned. confused. I would not want to scream Ned in throes of passion. Oh, right. <laughs> I this Ned. is this is actually true. This is kind of a tangent. Um <laughs> and once again, I sure do hope by now no one related to me is Please. listening to this. Please. But I have this rule which my best friends from high school know about. I <laughs> And presumably some people who used to be friends with me in college also know about it. I have a rule where, okay, rule is a strong word. (laughs) Basically, when we would be like on dating apps or like Mm -hmm. talking about potential guys, I was, it's not a rule, it's a test where I was like, I am not interested in swiping right or going out with a guy if I cannot moan their name with a straight face. Yeah. And so we would like test name. I mean, okay, that's like actually not a deal breaker. It's not going to stop me. But, but it's a consideration. Makes, yeah. No, that happened to me. There was this guy in undergrad. I won't name drop him, but he had a name that I generally do not like because he is a villain character in an 80s John Hughes movie. And um, I despise no, I that I want to know. You'll tell me I, later. I will tell you later. I thought I could handle it. And then as soon as I broke things off, it was like this breath of fresh air. Like the weight was lifted off my shoulders. My skin was clear. Like <laughs> I was so much happier. Rest in peace to that guy. Yeah, yeah, it didn't go well. <laughs> he thought it was more than it was, and I was like, "No, thank you." I apparently have uh, commitment issues. <laughs> like once, <laughs> this is turning into a therapy session. It is because, like, once, like, I'll have a crush on someone for like so long, and then if I end up with them immediately, I'm like, I have a better imagination. Oh my god, than you are as a person. <laughs> so. I mean, relatable, low key. But yeah, I've gotten myself into some trouble. Um, but yeah, so I I do agree that there are name deal breakers. Um, like I think I could handle most, but there are some that. Eh. Well, I mean, speaking of commitment issues, I do want to <laughs> talk about the League of Gentlemen and Witches. But first, I do want to mention that. Well, number one, this is one of my with serious society is one of my favorite relationship dynamics, mm-hmm. which is a smitten man. And oh, a very, yeah. like, cool presenting heroine mm-hmm. um, who is, of course, not as unaffected as she would have you believe. Um, mm-hmm. And she is also – you would think it would be him, the more chaotic of the two. It's not. And so their whole dynamic is him following her around, like, herding cats, <laughs> trying to prevent her from <laughs> she's just a, causing, like, she's wreaking a, havoc wherever she a goes. a basket of kittens. She is. Just... And it's an excellent dynamic. Um, and then I love seeing their bits in the second book. They're like it's the so highlight, fun. not the highlights, mm-hmm. but they are like their moments are little highlights every time they show up. <laughs> also, this is going to be perhaps a controversial take. This oh, no. has one of my favorite sex scenes in a romance novel. Really? Not because it's like really wild. Mm-hmm. It's pretty tame. Mm-hmm. There's only one. But I was blown away. I thought it was like the hottest shit I ever read. I remember like I had like the high, like a very high steam rating and I looked back and I was like, what? Was it's I not doing? very steamy. It is, no. however, I think some of the best character work that I've seen mm-hmm. done in a sex scene. I think it is so, so effective. Um, that, uh, one of my favorite scenes in the next book is during a sex scene. And he's like, you're so sensitive because he's like mm. and loving she, it. Yes. And then she like closes up because she thinks like she's been told her entire life like um, witches can't really have emotions. And she's and that she like, specifically is too yeah, soft. And, and they've used sensitivity as a detriment. And so when he is like, you're so sensitive, she, he like recodes a word for her. And it's mm-hmm. so lovely because then he's like, you're so responsive. And she's like, oh, this is a compliment. Oh, mm-hmm. my God. And it is just the softest bit. I love it so much. And it was adorable. 
It is really good. Ned mm-hmm. and Cecilia have a moment where he like recognizes that all of this is already a lot for her based on the way that mm. she was brought up. And so he chooses to let like he only partially undresses her and leaves, I mm-hmm. think, like her that, That's in the second one too. It. Is it really? Yeah. Um she you may be thinking in the second one. No, I'm definitely um, thinking of the first so one. So then because it's that's in this one too. Um she is like I'm going to leave my chemise on because um, I just don't – I'm not even naked in the bathtub. And so he's – and she expects him to, you know, make a big fuss. And he's like, sure, whatever. Okay, and then, I see. The difference, though, is that mm-hmm. Ned intuits it. Gotcha. He just, like – he starts to undress he keeps her and it on. specifically leaves that because he's okay. like, this is already very, very vulnerable mm-hmm. for her. And he doesn't want to push it any further. Mm-hmm. And so he intentionally leaves it. Um, there's also – They've been doing this running bit throughout the book, which is one of my favorite things, which is um, making fun of Victorian's sense of propriety, even though they are (laughs) doing really wild things, but they're not allowed to talk about said wild Mm -hmm. things. Um, Constantinople, like, running off in the graveyard, I think, is one of, like, the best examples of that, where, like, they don't talk about it, even though they're doing all the things. Mm -hmm. Um, And the the, the bedroom scene has a moment (laughs) where... She, what does she say? She says something about like I like that's a very rude word. <laughs> I think he says orgasm, and she's like, I don't know that word, but I suspect that you shouldn't say it. Yeah, to me. and he's like, okay, then I won't say it, but I intend to make you do it many times. And she's like, uh, well, that seems proper and like fair enough, which yeah. is just like so so Victorian, <laughs> where it's like, yeah, as long as you don't say it. Uh huh. Oh, like God, that's yeah. not a proper word to say to me i'm a lady but you can and do that's, it that's like the thing about these that like i don't need like the explicit like you know body action like you know like explicit mm-hmm. stuff if it, you know i still get the emotional reaction from mm-hmm. the sex scene because i just read um the bell of belgrave square by mimi matthews and she like her first book had like no talk of sex it was vaguely referenced that they had sex on their honeymoon but like it was not a thing ever mentioned in the book and then that was the Siren of Sussex. And then in this one, I had a little bit more because the entire second half of the plot revolved around their consummation because she wanted to get to know him before that happened. And so, like, already I, I know that it's going to be fade to black, closed door. So I'm like, how is this going to work? And it, it didn't really for me. Um, but it was still, I think the author recognized that you had to have something happening because it was a pretty important plot point um but it was still very vague like nothing really you didn't know what was happening to her body she was like he's part of me good night like whatever and so like i thought to myself i was like okay i don't know if this is because i just need open door or like what was happening but then like i read the league of gentlemen witches and i was like you know i don't need that explicitness if the scene itself gives me like all the the character work that happens in sex scenes normally like the emotional Mm -hmm. like closeness and stuff because like i don't think you really need a sex scene all the time if the book itself develops the relationship to that mm-hmm. extent um but for some reason the mimi matthews one just didn't work for me i don't wasn't v- like a big fan but mm-hmm. these i didn't need anything else like i, I wouldn't think sex need... scenes are just hard because mm-hmm. sometimes you do get really explicit ones and you're like yeah. okay that was great that was hot but like what'd you get didn't do it? anything yeah there was what was it i can't remember the book but the sex scenes just didn't function like I wanted them to. Like, there was never um, – I think it was Do You Take This Man by Denise Williams. And it was always, like, hard and fast. And they never had one where they, like, talked to each other or, like, mm-hmm. had, like, a, a very intimate moment. Like, maybe closer to the beginning. But, like, I thought a sex scene was coming towards the end. And then it didn't. And then we got a different one. But that was, like, just, like, very rough and, like, very quick. And I just learned nothing from that. Mm-hmm. Like, it was hot. But I didn't get any emotional connection to the characters or to, like, the relationship. And so, yeah, like, I love a good hot sex scene. But if it doesn't – like, I don't need them all to do something like that. But I want at least, like, one to, like, give me an insight into how they work. Like, how does, like, cleanup work? Like, how do they cuddle afterwards? Like, their dynamics mm-hmm. after, too. Yeah. And I think – india holden in both of the books mm. i mean league of gentlemen so witches is like a little bit steamier oh it, it is oh for sure it's not like wild but it's a mm. bit steamier and they have more scenes but even mm-hmm. then it's that same like it's not doing anything crazy but it's doing really heavy emotional lifting yeah particularly because in i mean there's 
some of Cecilia's arc is about physicality, but a lot of Charlotte and Charlotte and Alex's is about like physicality. And mm-hmm. in particular, like Charlotte embracing like magic and also freedom. And a, a part mm-hmm. of that for her is also like the freedom of her physical body. Mm-hmm. And I really liked how it didn't go so far into the like like such like she was never really afraid to have sex like it was Mm -hmm. where there's a lot of times in you know the regency victorian whatever eras where they're just like they can't do it because it's not like proprietous Mm -hmm. or whatever and there there was never really that like once she decided Mm -hmm. she wanted to she just she just did it and obviously she was like nervous and like i mean cecilia is the same way yeah and so i really like decided mm -hmm. and was like all right we're doing this Mm -hmm. now and then was nervous, no, I thought it was really fun. She still went through with it. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. Um, I love Charlotte and Alex. This one feels oh. like a, I'm going to say smaller, like in scope romance yes, than the first sure. one to me. It feels it's, much more it's like, like a road trip and intimate. I mean, yes. I mean, the first one is a road trip too, in a but sense, but more plot heavy. Yes. Like this one is, like I said, more romantic or like more of a rom, not necessarily more romantic, but more romancy. They're together a lot. And, I think because you don't have to have everything that happened in the first one to like get you grounded. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this one, I that's why this one is my favorite of the two so far. I can't wait to see the third one. Um, I mean, he's an Irish tattooed pirate. Like I, I can't get over that really well, at also, all. Oh, Alex O'Reilly and his and his scarred name. boots and his scarred boots, his scarred boots that come <sighs> back again and again. Which, by the way, parallel her boot. I could write an essay on like Alex and Charlotte as character foils and the way that like <laughs> yeah. their trauma yeah mirrors one another and it comes down to their boots like quite literally his like tall scarred boots that she repeated repeatedly is like depending on a woman's education they can make her tremble either with fear or like excitement true and I was like relatable um and then Charlotte's got various pairs of like very pretty Mm -hmm. fashionable boots that will then like shoot out poison darts or like create a cloud of fumes or like do all these things there's also a line that lives in my head rent free where alex is like do it step on me with those vicious little boots of yours and i was like step on me and then he was like she's gonna annoy me into an orgasm (laughs) stop i was dead (laughs) dead on the ground Uh, alex gets it he really does um uh, and then when he first realized he loved her I'm, of course, not going to be able to find it, but I just loved Like, he was like, okay, that's, that's what's happening. And I thought it was adorable. Um, Yeah, I that book, I was so in love. I'm going to try to find – I wish I could – I wonder if I'm going to be able to find the exact quote. But there – page 143. Why do I have that marked? Oh, that's <laughs> – okay, I don't know. There was a line – or, like, an exchange that really – I mean, they open up about their trauma periodically. There's a moment in the jail specifically, or, like, the dungeon, where Alex, like, mm-hmm. goes into detail about what happened to him. But there is one exchange in particular, and, of course, I marked it, and now I'm not going to be able to find it, where basically he – he's, like, someone should lock you up in a, in your room and only let you out on Sundays – and Charlotte says, you just described my childhood. Someone should, like, I don't remember exactly what she said, but something about, like, like beat you, right? Like, somebody yeah. should beat you. And he says, and you just described mine. Uh, Where, like, both yeah. of them really downplay. Yeah. Like, their childhood trauma into a, mm-hmm. like, kind of a, like, jokey little exchange. But if you're paying attention, that, like, hits. Where, you're, like, both of those are, like, whew, ow, are you guys okay? And they're not. But then they, like are able to open up mm-hmm. emotionally in each other. Ugh. And also in the wind, there's like a moment where she's standing on the roof with like the wind blowing in her hair. And I was like, bye. <laughs> this like makes me want to sob actually. Like clutching your card again. Um, like fully, yeah. I just want to burst into tears every time Charlotte is like, oh, magic is like beautiful and mm-hmm. freeing. And from me, the less beautiful and freeing side and just the hilarious side, when she describes um, the gentleman's fifth tumescent limb. Stop. I love that line. <laughs> or like small tumescent limb. It's like the gentleman's like, small never... tumescent limb. <laughs> <sighs> oh, I found the like... exchange. 
she says there should be a law against men like you while he's kissing her. Uh-huh. That's critical. And he says there is. Someone should lock you in a room and only let you out on Sundays. You just described my childhood. She thrust fingers into his hair, tilting his head back so she could kiss his throat. Who can I hire to have you beaten to a pulp? And you just described mine, he said. Uh-huh. And you're like, oh. And they're like making out, but also... <laughs> And then he goes, that's my witchy woman. Maybe not at that time. But he was really just like, that's my witchy woman. And I was like, every man should say that. Step on me with those vicious... I'm really just finding all the quotes, actually, now Mm -hmm. that I'm looking at my tabs. Step on me with those vicious boots of yours. I just passed the one... It's ungentlemanly for you to tell me what to do. Actually, no, I take that back. It's entirely gentlemanly. You, sir, (laughs) represent all that is wrong with our patriarchal society. (laughs) And you, madam, are the most enticing creature I have ever known. I want to lick every inch of you. He did love That's to lick. That's the mm-hmm. perfect character dynamic, dare I say. And um, so while the first book revolved a lot around the Brontes, this one was a lot about Jane Austen and Charlotte mm-hmm. loved Jane Austen, but like Jane Austen was a very um, almost limiting figure in her mind because she was mm-hmm. very proprietous and um, always it's like Jane Austen at this moment was in the back of her mind sipping something and like judging her. She's like, this is not what Jane Austen would do. Um, and then at one point, Charlotte had to declare, after all, there was no enjoyment like lovemaking. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. There are a ton of like Austin uh-huh. reworks of little. Mm-hmm. Like, and I liked how it, at the end she like brought it back together to where she still loved, you know, Elizabeth Bennett and stuff, but mm-hmm. she was able to be her own character in her own romance. Yes. And could also have sex. <laughs> it was also just such a great way of writing a neurodivergent character to Mm -hmm. have like because she is on the autism spectrum Mm -hmm. and so to have like she doesn't know how to act in social situations so she's constantly falling back on what would Jane Austen tell me to do in this situation as her way of navigating things and then getting outside of situations where Jane Austen could help and like (laughs) floundering and then learning to figure it out and like gain confidence in that area it's Mm -hmm. so lovely what this quote i just found when your future husband realizes you're not a virgin what will you tell him (laughs) to angle slightly to the left and rub with his thumb (laughs) and that is so like not the victorian heroine like where she's like and what about it (laughs) and that's what i love like it's just it it's so unique and hilarious well you really get that it's like that's her mother's influence because she has like the proper aunt aunt judith mm-hmm. honestly, yeah like and her mother Quinn. is also hilarious oh her mother's one of my favorite characters <laughs> um she is so funny she is constantly mm-hmm. talking about the things that, like that her husband did to her yeah with her and charlotte is like stop he like bought her a, some flowers and her aunt was just like making a comment about how something or another and then the wife and her sister in the back of her mind she's like well she doesn't want to know like how i thanked my husband for bringing me those flowers but she's constantly making dirty jokes Mm -hmm. and things and like talking Mm -hmm. about her sexual experience and like trying to get charlotte to like fall in love and you know try some things and so to have like and i think there's a moment too where she recognizes like i am like judith's like i am a plim but i'm also a pedifer and like the ability to embrace both sides of herself so lovely I also just want to talk about, um, please do the, cause there's just, I could talk about this entire book and every moment in it, but I think one of my favorite, like kind of, it's not one moment, but like extended moment is when they are running around, running from Aunt Judith, holding hands and everyone that they run into makes a comment about them being together and both Mm -hmm. of them are like we're not in love we're not together (laughs) and they like whoever they are talking to pointedly looks at their hands because they're still holding hands (laughs) yeah and they're just like no (laughs) we're not in love what are you talking about which like huh and then and then immediate or is it immediately after i think it is immediately after um after some incredible innuendo like a whole paragraph of it. Uh, Alex laughs and for the first time says, oh dear, I do love you. Yes. And there's that, like yes. pause. I um, love this scene. There's truly, I could read this entire page. But where do I start this? Um, the beginning of the book. <laughs> it's just yeah. the audio book. Um, she reading. says, only an uncouth person. He's made a joke about like her reaction last night. She says only an uncouth person employs lewd innuendo. It shows a kink in the imagination and I urge you to take a more somber penetrating perspective, Captain. It's not hard. 
<laughs> it is now, he muttered, but thankfully she did not hear him. I meant all the way to Lady Armitage's house, uh, which will be the climax of our efforts. Once I have the amulet, you can withdraw. <laughs> Alex laughed. Oh, dear, I do love you, he said. And silence clamped down between them. Um, he added, pushing a hand through his hair, metaphorically speaking, of course. Of course, Charlotte agreed hastily. She realized she had stopped walking, possibly because her heart seemed to have stopped beating. She began to stride once more along the street. Do not look so concerned on my behalf, Captain. It is a common enough statement. For example, I myself love that house there with the wooden shutters. I love tea. I love you and your smile mm -hmm. and the way you sigh in your sleep. See? Common. Unconcerning. We are still enemies. Mortal enemies, he agreed, <sighs> smiling. Was, so, like, get out of my face. It was face. That, that scene. I swear. I, I, I'm I assuming I, like, went on a rampage on my Instagram stories. Like, sure. I vividly remember my reaction. Like, because, like, I thought his was good. Like, I was like, yeah, like, he just said it. Like, I love that when they don't mean to say it. And, and then, like, her, re her reaction. Like, she, she just did it in the same way. <laughs> I actually could throw this book across the room right uh -huh. now. I love you and your smile and the way you sigh in your sleep. <laughs> See, common, unconcerning, we're still mortal enemies. Me, actually, if I ever fall in love. I'm like, it's fine, it's normal, we're enemies. Uh, yeah, um, truly, I said Heartbreaker was one of the most romantic books. This is also one of the most romantic books. This is books also one I've of the most romantic read. books. Um, and it also, similarly, it's just a ton of really small, mm -hmm. very adorable moments. Mm -hmm. And so, like, we've talked a lot about moments, but there are, for every moment we've talked about, there are, like, ten other ones that we haven't mentioned. Like, I laugh out loud listening to these audiobooks. Like, I'm mm -hmm. just laughing like a weird villain because they're just, it's hilarious. Is actually, it has no business being as funny no. as it is. No, I, like, I, I don't know how you followed up the Wisteria Society so well, you know? Like, mm -hmm. they're different. Like, they feel different. Like, but they're so good together. Yeah. I am simply Yeah, obsessed. and it's interesting, like, the, like it's clearly the same narrative, mm -hmm. like, authorial voice. Mm -hmm. It's the same style, but the – I don't know if it's the tone that's different. Like, the humor is the same. Yeah. But there's something in, like, the overall tone of the book that is, like, Charlotte and Alex's relationship is unique to them and separate yes. from Ned and Cecilia's relationship, even though a lot of the humor and a lot of the, like – and it narrative choices. Are I the mean, same. in this, it's a pirate versus a witch so that is already different, in a sense that mm -hmm. like, you know, witches have to be a lot more reserved, and you know, they could get burned alive if they're found out where pirates can just pirate <laughs> and like mm -hmm. get away with it. Um, and because then there's also like a is it a witch hunter or a pirate hunter throughout? And then yeah, it's and a then witch I found it hilarious that the Miss Plym, like her aunt, <laughs> immediately sees this witch hunter. And it's actually a disgusting scene. <laughs> and I say that as the highest compliment. <laughs> it is filled with the most disgusting flirtation I've ever uh, read. It is so funny. And so, like, you also, so, like, the villain, in a sense, because he's, like, par part of a, the villain set, like, there are a few, mm -hmm. like, it was just so hilarious. And then, like, the aunt understands at some point, like, <laughs> why people feel that, like, I don't know. It, yeah, worked it's really gross. Level. It's so gross. It's so gross, and it's so. Good. But like, you can like, and then they run away together. It. Like, you can visualize. Yeah. Like, I don't know where I've seen it before. Maybe like the uh, series of unfortunate events when mm -hmm. there's like the the one aunt who's like scared of everything, and then Olaf's like one character who like the sea captain who like goes with her. Like, I don't. It there's just such a weird visceral image. That I, I feel like I've seen that. Yeah, like the just the bad, the villains, the, like gross <laughs> villains flirting. <laughs> well, and also Aunt Judith or Miss Plym is an interesting character anyway, mm -hmm. particularly because you have the overbearing aunt in the first book, yeah. and so you think, oh, it's another overbearing aunt, and then they're very different mm -hmm. because what's her name in the first book? Um, that's a great question. I am blinking. She's great in the first the in Wisteria Society. The aunt mm -hmm. in there is a really love. Like she is overbearing. Mm -hmm. But it's out of love, mm -hmm. and you can tell. And, like, Cecilia loves her very much, even when she's kind of rolling her eyes at her. Versus, I mean, Miss Plym is also acting out of love. Yeah. But it is a really interesting portrayal of, like, a toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. Where, like, you love each other, but that doesn't make it okay. Yeah, because Charlotte's almost, like, she's, like, been made to be, like, the chosen witch, in mm -hmm. a sense. Because, like... So that... 
Judith can exert her control yeah, over. Yeah, because there was this moment where, <laughs> where another witch was going to have that title and then they, like, sabotaged her. <laughs> the soothsayer wound yeah. up with a knife in her back. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, huh, that must be a sign for something. Uh-huh. Ugh, and the covers. And the covers are just so gorgeous. Yeah, don't even get me started. <sighs> Truly, these books are so beautiful. And I for know. what? I um, love them. This has been over an hour. So I feel like probably we should wrap it we up. Wrap I don't even know how to pick a favorite scene from either of these because truly – I think you named mine with the way that they said they loved each other in the second book mm-hmm. because to me that was just a major serotonin hit. But also like I wanted to scream into a pillow and punch something out of love. Relatable. Mm-hmm. The first book, I think my favorite is the scene where Cecilia gets drunk. Oh my god. There are a lot of really, really good scenes in the first book, and I love all of them immensely, um, but there is a really funny scene. Like, that is the one that I think sticks in my mm-hmm. brain the most clearly, where they're, like, pretending to be <laughs> husband and wife named Victoria and Albert, and she gets drunk and is in complete denial of it. <laughs> and Alex is like, you are drunk. And she's like, no, that's crazy. And then they have, like, a moment where, like, they have to go to the hotel room and there's only one bed mm. and it but like it doesn't turn out the way that yeah. you think it does it's very charming um i think my favorite of the wisteria i mean gentlemen gentle women witches there's so many um but i think my favorite is actually the last scene not the epilogue but them well first they make love and float onto the ceiling oh yes while they are doing it because charlotte is just like so overwhelmed with happiness that her magic makes them float onto the ceiling Mm -hmm. and it's so lovely and it's after um why am i gonna cry looking over my notes for this scene um where they're like about to have sex and she realizes that like he's silencing her with pleasure and using intimacy this oh listen i'm about to start a whole other dissertation they use physical intimacy as a barrier so that they don't have to open up emotionally which is why this book is steamier than the first one because they've been doing that since the beginning of their relationship um and so finally she's like stop we need to talk and then she gets uncomfortable and is like never mind i don't want to just kiss me um and he's like no you're right (laughs) we're gonna talk so they have to have this whole like moment where they open up and have a conversation about how much they love each other Mm -hmm. and you know, all of the things. And then <laughs> get out of my face. Um, as he slowly filled her body and soul, she prophesied that this was how it would be from now on. Not just exercise, but love in the light. Oh, yeah, because they always called, they called uh, having sex exercising. So, like. Right, they were just exercising. But they just vigorously exercised all the time. Yes. And then afterwards, they have this, like, very lovely, just so romantic conversation um and then go i think they like sit up on the roof or go stand on the roof or something and they like fly into the sunset and he's basically like we're just gonna go wherever you want to go and then there really wasn't which like get out of my face it there really wasn't like a breakup like i think one of them thinks the other one died at one point which again covered this before yeah there's like the fight i love that they're like in the sky Mm -hmm. charlotte almost gets taken by the Mm -hmm. witch hunter but alex shows up Mm -hmm. and is like Mm -hmm. i think not yep Bixby is there. Very excited for the Bixby. The hero of the next one. Yeah, I uh, love – and I don't really think there was a like a third act breakup in the first one, was there? There was like a – after they sleep together, Ned was thinking like this is the ba- – like it was one of those like Cecilia thought it was just going to be a one-time thing and then like tragically they'll never see each other again mm-hmm. and Ned was like, no. <laughs> um, and he had to like come to the ball – there was like the 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 ball that he had to come propose to her with the uh, which get out of my face <laughs> he sh- he made her, he brought her a house that is also a library yes that was his like gift to her like, and I was like library. okay well <laughs> that should be illegal he also has like there's the love and the light line in gentlemen gentle women witches why can I not say that Ned has I think he says something about like let me take you out of time is that the line I'm thinking oh of I sure in their don't sex know. scene. Um, Caroline's just laughing. <laughs> well, I found the line that I mentioned earlier where he, he, she says, I suspect that is a rude word and you should not say it to me. And he says, fine, I promise never to say it again, but I shall do it to you as often as I can manage. And she says, well, I suppose that's in the bounds of good manners. Oh, I found it. Look at her. And I 
typed in out of tune. She says, hurry. And he says, sweetheart, let me take you out of time for a while. Uh, for a while. And he kissed her until even he forgot there was a world beyond Aww. this room. I could do a whole other episode. We should have done one episode per book. I mean, we'll bring them up whenever we can. In any, like, tropes <laughs> or whatnot. They will so. show up Try to stop us. Because <laughs> we're annoying and obsessed with those books. Yeah. Um, and you should read them. Romance that TBR.